Моє чола життя, я був, можна сказати, син діпістів. I was raised in the cause. And we all know what I mean when I say I was raised in the cause. I was raised in the cause of Ukraine's national liberation. The whole purpose of my parents' exile, my father, a Bandarevich, my mother, a slave laborer in Nazi Germany, their whole purpose in life, and they married and met in a DP camp, Freiman Kasserin near Munich, was to return home. Home was not Canada. Home was not North America. Home was not the DP camps. Home was Ukraine. Zavrnutisha na Ukrainu. Zdobuti vilnu samostinu ukrainsku državu. That was the purpose, to achieve an independent Ukrainian state. American and British psychologists who visited the DP camps immediately after the war's end wrote very eloquently about the compulsive need on the part of the DPs to return home. The DPs had an abiding interest in the fate of their homeland. Many of you, I know many of you, spent almost all your lives in here in the United States thinking about what was happening in Ukraine and hoping that maybe someday there'd be a free Ukraine and you'd return to it. You sat on packed suitcases. And in fact, in looking at the excellent exhibit that we have around here, and I congratulate the, all the people involved in putting it together, I noticed the suitcases up in the little display on the next floor. But how long can you wait? How long can you stay in a refugee camp? And of course, the answer is not very long. In my parents' case in 1949, they left Fryman Kasern and emigrated to Canada. But in Canada, they continued to organize. They continued the struggle. They continued to desire a return to the homeland they'd been driven from. And they instilled in me and in my sister the same passion for Ukraine, which I never saw until 1989. And so when I earned my PhD at the University of Alberta, I earned it for a dissertation that dealt with the DP experience, which is why I'm here tonight. You just heard mention of the title of the book, Searching for Place, Ukrainian Displaced Persons, Canada, and the Migration of Memory. And when I was doing that book and finishing it up, I began looking for photographs. And so just like the curator of this exhibit, I put newspaper articles together, I wrote to people I knew, and I said, do you have photographs of the DP camps and of life in the camps? What was it like? I need some good photographs. And for me, as a political geographer, I was particularly interested in photographs that showed political activism. I wanted to see the political dimension of the Tabore. And I see around us here displays on education, on health, on youth, on religious affairs, but there's actually not as much as I might have expected about the political dimension of the camps. Because we all know that it was intense and it was focused on competition between groups struggling to achieve Ukraine's independence. I had almost given up hope about finding a good cover photograph for my book when one day a friend of a friend from Winnipeg said to me that he'd heard of a gentleman who just passed away whose son had some tiny one inch by one inch black and white photographs from the camps that his father had left him. And that one of those photographs showed a demonstration in Munich in the spring of 1949. And that he was going to send me those photographs so I could take a look at them. And one day, sure enough, an envelope arrived and I opened the envelope and I pulled out the photographs and one of them instantly caught my eye. Now, thank you for the organizers of the event tonight for blowing it up. It used to be about that big. But here it is, and I'll leave it here for you. You can see an example of a political demonstration, Munich 1949, signs in English, Ukrainian, and German, talking about bloodthirsty Moscow and the slaughter of innocents and so on. That in itself is an interesting image. It's exactly what I was looking for, but it had one other component that I found absolutely striking. And when we talk about fate and how we encounter DPs, this is one that really made me sit up and think. Because I recognize someone in the photograph, even though I was born in 1953, the year Stalin died, that's why I have the mustache. 
um, <laughs> in Kingston, Ontario. I recognize someone from Munich, 1949. There in the front ranks of this political demonstration marches my father. So it was a, a remarkable kind of sense of deja vu. There he was, moving forward with his comrades, moving forward, not yet recognizing that he would one day move on to Canada. Today he's almost 99 and still Tipichny Bandarevich, what can I say? <laughs> he hasn't heard whether uh, the Bandarevich have taken over heaven yet, so he's not sure if he wants to die. <laughs> but in Canada, he was certainly one of those who wanted to rekindle, to husband the resources of the diaspora, to take the belief that Ukraine should be free and pass it on to his children, which he did. So he gave me and my sister and others in our small community a sense that being Ukrainian was heroic, that being a DP was not being a quote-unquote dumb Polak, as someone said, or a disputed person, but rather something you should be proud of, a person driven into exile perhaps, but someone who would one day return. So for most of my life, I had a heroic image of the displaced persons, and that certainly is still the image I have. But I also want to talk about the other side of the DP experience. And my colleague, of course, has hinted at some of this already. There was this psychological and spiritual trauma of the refugee experience. People had endured in Ukraine a great deal before the Second World War. And of course, I'm thinking here of the terror of the Holodomor, of the pacificatia, of the ignorance of the world about the Ukrainian national cause. There were, of course, Ukrainians found themselves in what the historian Timothy Snyder has referred to as the bloodlands, the area between Germany and Russia that saw so much devastation, so much loss of life between the 1930s and the 1940s. When they finally got to the DP camps, that too was an enervating experience. Fear, uncertainty, hunger, deprivation, overcrowding, tension between inhabitants, tension between ethnic or national minorities, third world war fears, family relations severed, status change, all these things occurred. <laughs> the trauma of the refugee camps, I think, is best shown in a document I found in doing my own research that deals with both forcible repatriation and the unnatural, almost inhuman conditions that some people labored in in the camps. I'm going to quote to you the story of a young woman, Natalka Bilka was her name, who found herself in a DP camp called Wagner near Liebens in Germany. She was originally from Veliko Ukraina, from Zaporozhye. 21 years old, she was pregnant. During the birth of her baby boy, she became, according to the report, violent, quote, reportedly and repeatedly tearing at the navel string, gnawing on the placenta, and behaving aggressively toward the infant. She was soon removed to a mental hospital, Feldhof, where attending physicians diagnosed her as having always been a mental case. And without consultation with her, her illegitimate son was then certified as a Soviet national and repatriated to the USSR without his mother, whose fate remains unknown. So I think that kind of example gives you a sense of some of the traumas that people suffered as political refugees. Of course, eventually, as Professor Wyman has mentioned, they had to move on. And of course, then they found themselves in new environments where their linguistic incompetence, their low status, their impoverishment, the traumas they experienced, their loss of voice, all, of course, militated against them becoming influential even during the Cold War period. Ukrainians and other DPs became the other. They were, found themselves in societies that were largely indifferent to things Ukrainian. Despite their organizational abilities, despite the efforts they made on the educational front, on youth groups, in theater and culture and so on, most non-Ukrainians would more often than not say, what is a Ukrainian? Where is Ukraine? There is no such place as Ukraine. A refrain that I heard for most of my life. Now, 
The topic of my presentation, really the, the main theme, is what didn't the DPs tell us? What didn't they share with us? And there are really two dimensions to this in my mind. What didn't they tell us because they couldn't tell us because they were already gone or dead? And what didn't they tell us because they didn't want us to know? Let me talk about first what they couldn't tell us because they were gone or dead. Today, one of the main themes in our community in the diaspora is the whole Demore, the genocidal Great Famine of 1932-33 in Soviet Ukraine. There's an excellent Holdemore committee here in Chicago, uh, which has been very generous in its support of some of the work I've done, and I want to thank them here tonight. There are many other groups, of course, throughout our community, both in Canada, the United States, and abroad, who are now researching the whole of Demore. Why has it been such a difficult struggle for us to tell the world about what was arguably the greatest single act of genocide to be fouled 20th century European history. And the answer is simply that there aren't too many survivors in the West. Why aren't there survivors in the West? Well, the answer is fairly straightforward. Between September 1st and, sorry, between 21st of May and September 1st of 1945 alone, 1,855,910 people, Soviet citizens, were handed back by the Western Allies to the Soviets. A rate of about 10 to 11,000 people per day, such a great rate that the Soviets themselves complained to their British counterparts and said, slow down, we can't process that many per day. Not only were thousands of people who had survived the whole of the war and the terror sent back, but they were sent back under extremely brutal conditions. Let me just give you a couple of examples of how Western governments dealt with Ukrainian Soviet citizens who refused to go back despite the terms of the Yalta Agreement. The Orthodox Church Archbishop of Volin in Lutsk, His Grace uh, Metropolitan Polycarp, wrote to the Archbishop of Canterbury about what had happened in an American zone of occupation camp uh, near Kreigsfeld. He wrote, quote, these Ukrainians protest that on the 25th of March 1946, an American officer and soldiers accompanied by the UNRWA director, Colonel Schartzhorf, forcibly evicted a number of Ukrainians from the camp. These unfortunate Ukrainian refugees were beaten with rifle butts, some to the point of unconsciousness, and then dragged onto waiting Soviet lorries. The petitioners begged us to ask you to raise our voice in their defense against the satanical Soviet attempts at our lives and souls. Another report from the same time period writes about a situation in Kempton, Germany, where, quote, the soldiers entered and began to drag people out forcibly. They dragged the women by their hair and twisted the men's arms up at their backs, beating with the butts of their rifles. One soldier took the cross from the priest and hit him with the butt of his rifle. Pandemonium broke loose. The people in a panic threw themselves from the second floor, for the church was in the second story of the building, and they fell to their deaths or were crippled for life. In the church, there were also suicide attempts. What this really tells us, and there are many examples of this, as I'm sure Professor Wyman and I could point out to you, is that literally the Western allies, the governments of Canada, the United States, Great Britain, and France, knowingly, consciously sent people back to their deaths. And in fact, Professor Watson Kirkconnell, one of the greatest friends of the Ukrainian-Canadian community at the time, who was an advocate for refugee immigration, wrote that this was a moral calamity of the first order, and if the Canadian government continued to be involved, it would in fact be involved in, quote unquote, a crime against humanity. To save themselves, what did victims of the whole of the war, survivors of the Soviet system do? They lied. They lied about who they were. Instead of admitting that they were indeed Soviet citizens, they instead portrayed themselves as Polish Ukrainians or Romanian Ukrainians or stateless people. They falsified their papers. They falsified their stories before screening commissions. They passed through the screening process and emigrated eventually 
Canada, to the United States, where they remained, as was pointed out, in fear, in fear of being discovered. Because if you immigrated to Canada or to the United States and lied to the immigration officials, you obtained your citizenship under false pretenses. And if you did that, you could, of course, be denaturalized and reported back to where you came. So many, not all, but many of those who came from Veliko Krina had to lie to save themselves. And until the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, and indeed, in some cases to the present day, most of the Ukrainians from Veliko Krina did not talk about their experiences, did not share their recollections of the Holodomor, were afraid to. And even in the Harvard research study that was done at the time of the refugee crisis, the Harvard researchers themselves didn't ask about the Holodomor, and in fact, were discouraged from inviting comment on that by the Harvard team themselves. So we have Western complicity in the repatriation forcibly of Holodomor survivors. We have Western complicity in what was, I would argue, a crime against humanity. And we as a community, along with our friends in the Baltic communities and others who were DPs, who were the sons and daughters of DPs, should be holding Western governments accountable for those war crimes. Let us not simply excuse this as the Yalta Agreement, something that happened several decades ago. Let us move forward as a community and make claims for redressing what is fundamentally a historical injustice. Now there's another issue here, the issue of what the DPs didn't tell us because they did not want to harm the cause of Ukrainian national liberation. We were raised, many of us, with a very patriotic, with a very positive image of who the DPs were, of who the patriots were, whether we were Bandariuchi or Melnikiuchi or Dvikari or Divizinike, whatever the group, all of themselves portrayed themselves as heroic, as people who struggled for Ukraine's national independence, and indeed many of them were. But what about our relations with other ethnic communities? With the Poles, for example, in Volin in 42-43. With the Nazis, with the Soviets. What about the role of the Oum's ideology? What about the UPA and the Divizia? Were these individuals war criminals or collaborators? These are questions that you all know have plagued our community for decades. And though I thought this issue might have gone away by now, it's being revived in our day. Timothy Snyder, who I've mentioned just a few moments ago in his book, Bloodlands, talks about an equally difficult question, the question of Jewish collaboration with the Soviets. And he comes up with a formula, if you like, that I think is fair and accurate. He says that not all Jews were communists, and not all communists were Jews, and I would certainly agree with that. But then, not all Ukrainians were collaborators, and not all collaborators were Ukrainians. So we have to make that message clear. We have to understand better the ideology of Oum and Upa, we have to begin exploring the archives, both of post-Soviet Ukraine and the archives of the diaspora. And our archives in the diaspora are in some ways harder to find and get at than the archives of post-Soviet Ukraine. This is amazing that those of you who came from Ukraine, who were members of organizations that reestablished your networks in North America and Western Europe, the diaspora, Emiratia, do not give scholars access to those archives. And so we're left fending off partisan accounts of who you were by people who have better access than your own researchers. The archives of post-Soviet Ukraine are partially open. And we can also find material about Ukraine and issues like the Holodomor in some unusual sources. The Romanian National Archives, believe it or not, are now beginning to yield archival evidence about the Holodomor. And as was mentioned uh, a moment or two ago, a recent book that just came out last week called The Holy Sea in the Holodomor represents a collection of documents that my colleague Dr. McVeigh and I found in the Vatican secret archives, proving that the Vatican knew about the Holodomor, knew that it was catastrophic, knew that more people were dying than in the 1921 Volga famine, and tried to help, but was blocked by the Soviet authorities, which I think puts a different light on the Vatican than perhaps most of our used to seeing. 
I think if I were to sort of speak about uh, the DP experience in general terms, I would do best by, again, quoting how the DPs describe themselves. And Professor Wyman did some of this a moment or two ago. I think one of the best statements I ever heard, or, or read rather, I should say, about how the DPs felt about themselves was given in October of 1946 by Ukrainian residents of DP camp number 751 Ludendorff Kasern near Dusseldorf. And this is what they wrote, quote, although the brown and the black fascists were overthrown more than a year ago, we thousands of political refugees, banished, unhappy victims of the Second World War, continue to live in an atmosphere of uncertainty, always afraid of tomorrow, always waiting a new commission, fearing to be repatriated by force. We're living in the unbearable nightmare of Bolshevik NV KVD persecution. We are being suspend, suspected of being collaborators or deserters of the Red Army or war criminals in order for them to have a pretext to give us over by force to the Soviets and be killed by them. Such things cause depression among the DPs and even lead some of them to suicide. We are all homesick, but we cannot return to our country where there's no shade even of democratic liberty owing to the regime's red totalitarian system and the physical and, co and moral oppression there. That same regime of terror stretches its hands even here to reach us. As real anti-fascists and Democrats, we protest before the whole civilized world against these efforts of the Red Terror. Referring then to the Atlantic Charter, they continued, Miss Roosevelt and Mr. Truman's declaration in the name of the high ideals of Christianity, humanity, and democracy, we call upon. We call upon the whole Christian world to assure us of our human rights and democratic liberties. We ask unanimously, one, to recognize for us the right of asylum. Two, to assign for us a safe place where we can live freely. Three, to give us the possibility of working according to our capacities. Four, to assure us the liberty of religion. We call upon the moral consciousness of the whole civilized world and the representatives of Christianity to free us from the everlasting nightmare and fear and assure us democratic liberties. We long, of course, to return to our own country, but we cannot do it as long as there is no democratic liberty available there. We Ukrainians assembled at this meeting avail ourselves of this opportunity to express our deep gratitude to the British military government in Dusseldorf for their kindness and generosity which they show to us and hope they will take further care of us and help us to become people who have common human rights. Nationally recognized state on the world map if perhaps not yet free. And that enfeebled us, that enerv enervated us. Comparatively feeble politics exist within the Ukrainian diaspora today. We are often interested in Pirohe and Pivo and protests and occasionally prayers. Uh, but by and large, we have lost the cause that our parents and, and our generation to some degree was engaged in. And the fourth wave that was mentioned at the very beginning of tonight's presentation, although some of them are interested in the DP experience, are following their own different pathways. So the question I think we have to consider here, and I'll end my marks in a few moments, is, is the time of the DP experience over? Is it too late to recover the historical memory of who the DPs were and what they accomplished? I think the answer is no. And yet, time is certainly running out. Other people who are not necessarily positively or favorably inclined toward the Ukrainian cause of national independence are writing the history of the DPs, are writing the history of the Ukrainian national liberation struggle, are undermining the cause with their words and their deeds in the early 21st century. Therefore, what the DPs suffered, what they endured, and many of them were indeed heroes of their day, is being lost, is being taken away from us, and will be completely erased from the historical record if we as a Hromade, if we as a diaspora do not collectively act now. And that is why I'm profoundly grateful for those who put together this experience, the DP Experience Exhibit, 
for reminding us of who our parents and grandparents were, what they tried to do, what they achieved, and a cause that's not yet done. Dujavam Jack.